Everybody come to praise God today. Put your hands up. Let's go. fasting well in the new testament jesus commands us he says when you fast fasting is commanded it's a way to humble yourself before god to sacrifice and many times we saw in scripture that it was for repentance in um, nehemiah and ezra and in james it speaks about it's a time for repentance it's also a time of petitioning towards god to asking god to act in ways in our lives and in the lives of the world around us that there's nothing we can do. We're relying on him. It's a preparation to prepare our hearts. Um, it's what Jesus did to prepare for his ministry, 40 days in the wilderness. We see this example all throughout scripture. It's also a way to find direction, to really turn to God, rely on God, and to hear from God. So as a church, we're doing 21 days of prayer, fasting, and acts of faith. The fasting, it's up to you. Uh, the goal being that fasting is a way for us to depend on God, to humble ourselves before God, to petition God, to prepare our hearts and to find direction. I'm super excited about keeping God first.
Thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battles won, but you have never. Failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never.
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never end. Come on. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Good morning, church. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, we're continuing our God First series, and it has been so good so far. We began this year off talking about putting God first and what that means for God's people. You know, James kicked us off with two lessons back to back, anchor and come and see. And then last week, John talked about the making of a champion. You know, we as a culture and a community, when we think about the idea of putting God first and what that means, sometimes we, we can start to struggle and say, like, what does that mean? Like, how, how would that even look like to put God first? You know, sometimes the thought could go through our minds like, yeah, 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 yeah. I put God first, you know, like first I pray, then I get to work. I pray, then I hustle. I pray, then I get it going. I pray, then I win. Sometimes we put prayer in front of whatever. And then like the first thing we do is God. But are we really putting God first? What does the scriptures teach about that? What does it really mean to put God first? You know, what the scriptures teach us is quite different. What the scriptures teach us, a God first mindset isn't simply an action. It isn't simply an activity. It's a lifestyle of putting God first. It's a lifestyle of putting God first in every single situation and every circumstance we find ourselves in. You see, a God first mindset includes some of the habits that some of us are really great at. It includes posting on Instagram and Facebook your scripture of the morning and what you read in the morning. It includes having times of Bible study, reading the scriptures, drawing closer. We call it a quiet time. It includes listening to podcasts. It includes singing to God with all your heart. It includes those things, but it's deeper than those things. It is a complete mindset change. To have a God first mindset. You know, the challenge is we're being confronted as a society that's trying to form us. Our society is actively trying to form us. And it does it in the most insidious ways, and it does it metaphorically that our culture is trying to shape us into whatever it desires. We have become now the, the product. They're, they're trying to shape us, they're trying to get us to buy things, get us to be certain people. And yet, God's desire is that we would have a God first mindset. God's desire is that we would put him first. We would allow him to dictate how we look. You know, when we live out God's story, we become a counter story to the larger story of the culture. The culture is going one way and God's people are going another way. And we see it clearly when we're living faithfully to what God calls us to do. If you're seasoned in your walk with God, you've been a Christian for a long time. I want to encourage you to have a God first mindset. If you're, in, if you're inquiring, you don't know if you want to be a Christian, I want to encourage you and I want to stir your imagination today what it will look like for you to have a God first mindset. The Psalms are a counter story. Psalm 1 is a counter story to our culture. The book of Psalms are poems, songs, and prayers that set the mindset of Israel 
and the early church to have a God first mindset. And you know what a God first mindset is? It's a winning mindset. And we all want to win. Back in the day, DJ Khaled had a song, all I want to do is win, 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 no matter what. As Christians, we want to win. We want to win. I want us to jump into Psalms chapter 1. Bless is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You know, like I already mentioned before, the title of today's lesson is having a winning mindset. And so as we look at Psalms chapter one, this one begins the entire Psalms here. And it's important because it's trying to set the pace for what it would mean to meditate and wrestle with this book right here. But bigger picture, what it would mean to meditate and wrestle with God's will. You know, we want to live victoriously. We want to have a victorious life. Many of us, when we're watching movies, we envision ourselves being the hero, the main character, the most important thing. And in many ways, that could be characteristic of the Christian life so long as we remember the only reason we're the hero, the main character, is because of God. And the psalmist is trying to help us adopt that victorious mindset, that winning mindset. The psalmist begins with blessed. You know, we usually say bless you when you sneeze. When, you're, when you post something really cool on Instagram, like brand new shoes, you put hashtag blessings. When you post something about your spouse, hashtag blessing. You know, usually that's when we use that word. You know, a lot of translations use the word blessing. And, it, it, and other transla transla translators use the word happy. So those words are closely related. Now, here's what's very important that we get. The happiness or the blessing that the scriptures that talk about comes not from anything circumstantial, not from anything that the wind could distort and blow away, but it comes from a profound joy found in your relationship with God. That's a blessed life. That's a happy life in Christ. That's a happy life in God. And so the blessedness comes from a life focus to live according to God's instructions. When the psalmist talks about law, since he's just talking about God's instructions, this individual is blessed if they live according to God's instruction. And then he mentions that the, this blessed person doesn't walk in this path, doesn't stand with this group, doesn't sit with this group. This blessed person doesn't take advice on how to have a life that pleases God from the wicked. Now, wicked if you were in the Northeast, you're like, that's really cool. That's what that word means. Wicked it translates cool. But down here, wicked feels super evil. You're like, wicked, whoa. But really, it's the person who is bent on not following God. That's what the psalmist means when he uses the word wicked. Now, seldomly is it that cut, cut and dry when someone is actively trying not to please God or actively trying not to honor God. A lot of times it's a lot of gray and we have to be very careful. So I want to talk about some of those gray areas when it comes to making sure we're living the blessed life, the, God, the life that God desires us to have so we can have a victorious lifestyle. You see, CNN can disciple a lot of you guys. You watch Chris Como, you watch Anderson Cooper, I don't know anyone else on CNN, you watch those shows and they can start to shape how you think about people, shape how you think about yourself, shape how you think about your finances, shape how you think about the country, how you think about the church. Same thing, you go over to Fox and you're, you're listening to whoever the big person on Fox is, they shape 
how you think about yourself, shape how you think about the country, shape how you think about the church. You go over on MSNBC, same exact thing. They're shaping you. Like I mentioned earlier, society is trying to form you. They're trying to make you think a certain way. They say certain words knowing it's going to tug at your heart and start to manipulate your behavior. That's good marketing. They need you to keep coming back. They need you to, to view whoever they think ought to be your enemy is your enemy. They need that. Otherwise, they won't get you to keep viewing them. Social media is the same thing. You go on Twitter, you follow a couple of people, and they suggest other people similar to those people to follow so you can stay in your echo chamber that's forming you. Those things are forming and shaping us. But it isn't just them. Modern therapy, I'm so grateful. We have learned to embrace therapy, learned to embrace emotional health, learned to embrace mental health. I think that's I think we're in a good place when the church is embracing those things. But I want to caution us that we don't embrace a therapy that disregards repentance. We don't want to embrace a therapy that looks at God's ways and God's word as an enemy. God's ways and God's word is life. And I think therapy and mental health and emotional health are great tools to enhance God's life. But we have to make sure that we're not taking advice from people who are not desiring to live like God. Or at least not taking advice wholeheartedly from people who are not desiring to live like God. But, you know, other things that form us, family, family forms us. You know, our family helps us think the way we think, helps us behave the way we behave. Our family shapes our church culture. There's a church culture that we have here in the One Miami Church that you have if you're a part of another church, that you have if you're part of another church currently that shapes how you think about God. Some of it's good. Some of it's not so good. But you have to be mindful of what's shaping you. Same thing with culture. I mean, Hollywood. Hollywood decides what's beautiful. Like right now, beards and... And, and tattoos on, on your pinky is in, tomorrow may not be in, and you regret getting a pinky tat. But it shapes music. Back in the day, my music was like fire. Neptunes used to make great beats. Now no one even wants a Neptunes beat. But they shape how we think of music, they shape what we like. They shape what is cool. And yet, the psalmist is saying, God wants to shape us. God wants us to God wants us to look to him to see what a blessed life looks like. And so how do we do that? How do how are we supposed to understand how to be formed by God and be shaped by God? He says easily. Delight in God's word. You know, we could re replace that word delight with desire God's word. And that's hard today. You know, uh, many of us who have been Christians for a long time, you could get tired of reading God's word which is why podcasts have become um, ubiquitous. And we want to listen to other, other people expound and teach deeply on scriptures, which I think is good. But we want to be in the habit of picking up God's word and lend, allowing it to look like honey, man. You're like, mm, this is good. This is good stuff. We want to be guided by God's word. We want to be guided by the scriptures. We want to wrestle with the scriptures. You know, again, I, I, I've shared this plenty of times in the past, but I want to share it now with even greater urgency. The scriptures were never meant to be read and understood in one day. This is a lifetime journey walking with God. So don't feel bad if you're reading a part of scripture and you're like, I didn't have that mountaintop experience. What's happening when you're reading scripture, when you're meditating on scripture, it's starting to form you. But first you have to desire it. Do you desire God's word? Do you wake up in the morning and be like, I want to read God's word. I want to read the laws. I want to read the prophets. I want to read the writings. I want to read the gospel. I want to read the epistles. Do you desire God's word? Because if you do, you're one step closer to the victorious life. You're one step closer to having a winning mindset. And that's what we all want. We all want to win no matter what. That's the song from DJ Khaled I mentioned earlier. I haven't been listening to him, if you're wondering, but that every time I hear the phrase winning, it makes me think of DJ Khaled. You see, first you got to desire it, and then the next part is you got to meditate on it day and night. Day and night. Day and night, meditating on God's word. The Hebrew word is really talking about like a chanting, a low, a low chanting, like 
whispering God's word like, oh man, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked. Blessed is the one who does not stand in the way that sinners take. He's talking about this whispering day and night. You, you, you read something profound. You read, you read Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and it's like, you're walking onto the college campus, you're walking into the workplace, and you're like, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son. It's this whispering that the psalmist is encouraging us as you hear God's word, grab it. As we're opening up in God's scripture, grab it. We hear sermons every Sunday. If any of these scriptures are just impacting you, grab it and start meditating on it day and night, and you will start to form a winning mindset. When one not shaped by the culture, one not shaped by your own personal imagination, but one shaped by the one who shaped everything, God. And that's where the minute winning mindset lies. But it takes us to meditate on his word day and night. We want to be people who enjoy the wins. When the Heat was winning NBA championships, I loved it. When the Canes was winning, I loved it. When they're not winning, I still love them because I'm loyal. Dolphins? I ain't never seen the Dolphins win a playoff game in my life. But I'm loyal. Now, we got some real hardcore loyal people like uh, Rocco. He's super loyal. But I'm loyal, man. I told my wife first time I met her, my favorite team is the Dolphins. She laughed. And I told her, I still love you. I am loyal. We want to have a winning mindset. We want to enjoy our wins. So the psalmist gives us two illustrations. One is a tree and the other is shaft. So the psalmist says this tree is planted by streams of water, which when you think about it is the place where the tree will get the most um, substance. It'll get the light and it'll get the water. It'll always be filled and its leaves will always be green and it will always bear fruit. To bear fruit in Christ is a win. To bear fruit in Christ is a win. Every time the calendar year comes to an end, I look back and I'm always amazed and encouraged by how much God has bore fruit in my life. In areas I've grown in my patience, in areas I've grown in my kindness, in areas I've grown in my humility. And when I'm bearing fruit, I feel every single W. W being for um, a win. I feel every single W. I think too often we don't check and look at how much we've grown and really get on our knees and say prayers of thanksgiving. And just being like, hallelujah, I'm growing. Hallelujah, I'm maturing. This is so cool. This is so amazing. And it really is. It really is. I'm always encouraged when people are like, when I'm sharing about my past life and who I was before I made Jesus Lord, I'm always encouraging people, I can't see that in you. You're like, good, the Holy Spirit is doing his work in me. Good, the Holy Spirit is transforming me. I'm encouraged you can't see that person. You see, I feel rooted even when the world around me is falling apart because I've planted myself, or at least I've tried to plant myself where God is. I'm trying to be near where God is. I'm trying to be close as possible to God. And this is what the psalmist is saying, like, if you're planted, if you're rooted, if you're like this tree rooted, you're going to bear fruit. Your, your, your leaves are always going to be green. And that's what we all want to be. In every season, we want to experience prospering. And again, I want to be careful that we're not confusing what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel that overemphasizes material blessing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having Christ formed in you. I'm talking about being shaped to look at yourself the way God looks at you. That's a winning mindset. That is living victorious. That is enjoying the fruit when you can look at yourself the way Jesus looks at you. When you can see yourself being formed in the Christ. This is what the psalmist, he didn't know yet because Jesus was coming, but this is what the psalmist was communicating that this person who was rooted in the truth of God's word, rooted in the presence of God, would be a person who would bear fruit. Now, the contrast is shaft. I'm not a farmer, never been on a farm. I find farming life pretty creepy. Um, it just feels like there's nothing out there but scarecrows and evil. But it's probably great, but I've never done it. And he says shaft. Wheat, I mean, the shaft comes from beating the wheat when they make the separation. 
And what do you do with the shaft? You burn it. You throw it away. It's meaningless. What you really wanted was the grain from the wheat. That's what you really wanted. And so living a lifestyle of wickedness, a lifestyle built on rejecting God's ways and teachings is a life that's meaningless like shaft. It don't mean nothing. You know, it takes deep sobriety. It takes a level of self-reflection and it takes a, a mind that can ponder way past the moment to be able to realize how fruitless sin is, how futile sin is. You know, to conjure up my inner lack is sin is dumb. Seriously, if you can stop and reflect on it, sin bears no fruit. Sin brings nothing good out of it. But the deception, because we're being formed by other things instead of God, is maybe if I keep sinning, eventually I'll accomplish my goal. But no, sin never accomplishes the goal that God has for you, the winning mindset, the life living victoriously. You know, I think about how many people this past winter during Christmas didn't spend time with their family because they, their relationships are fractured because of sin. There was gossip, there was slander, there was this. And so they're fractured because of sin. Mothers and daughters haven't spoken in a long time because of sin. Fathers and sons because of sin. Daughters and fathers because of sin. Children not speaking to one another. Siblings because of sin. Sin fractures. Sin causes a lot of people to go in debt. Did you know that? Some of us go in debt because circumstances are tough. Many people go into debt because of sin. Greed, you want more than you should have. So you look good on the gram, but when it comes to your account, you're getting overdrawn. Sin, sin produces nothing you desire. Some of us have health challenges because the lifestyle of partying, the lifestyle of indulging. And we have those memories, but then we carry this this, this shell of a body because it's been ravaged by sin. Some of us live in a state of paranoia. We're scared. Man, I hope my wife doesn't check my phone. I hope this person doesn't look at my internet browser. I hope my boss doesn't find out this. We're scared and we've been ravaged. That shaft. The, the psalmist is saying, man, that stuff, the wind blows away. And that's what happens when it comes to sin. It takes one situation for a sinful life to fall apart. One. And what God is offering you is a winning lifestyle. Disciples, God is offering you a winning lifestyle. Friends who are interested in Jesus, he is offering you a winning lifestyle, but it requires you to have a God first mindset, which is a winning mindset. I don't know about you, but in 2021, I'm trying to get some W's. I'm trying to win this year. God's desire is that you win. And so in verse five through six, as he's talking here and he's like, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What he's talking about is in a healthy spiritual community. In, a, in something like a church. The wicked don't set the agenda. The wicked don't set what it means to be righteous. We love those people. We serve those people. But woe to us if we ever allow people who are actively not trying to follow God dictate what's going on in the church. Dictate what's going on with God's people. We don't want them to set the agenda. We don't want them to set judgments in our fellowship. And what he means is like saying this is the way it's going to be. Those sort of judgments. How do we make sure we're that community? We got to make sure we're being formed by God. It's equilibrium to one degree that we're going to spend time in the world and spend time with God. But we want to make sure that we're actively spending time with God, even when we're in the world. If you look at your screen time on your phone, some of you spend three hours on Instagram, two hours on YouTube, an hour on Safari. You just spend a full time job just looking at other stuff. But then you only spend this much time with God's people, this much time fellowship in with God's people, this much time in prayer, this much time in Bible study, this much time seeking and serving people. And so you wonder why you're not being formed into Christ and you're looking more and more like the world. And then you get upset when believers try to help you have that winning mindset to live and think like Jesus. You get upset at them because you feel like 
they're just lame, they're old, they're antiquated, they're dated, whatever. But you've been formed by the world and you're being formed by the world. And so I really want us to have self-reflection. I love what the psalmist says. He says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. That word, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, the Lord watches over, that phrasing in the Greek, not in the Greek, in the Hebrew, is this, this idea of this intimate concern, at least what Robert Alter says, is this intimate concern for the righteous. It's like, what, is they, what are they doing? How, how are they behaving? I want to make sure that they're okay. I want to I wanna give myself um, to them with, with unique attention in their behavior. As many of you know, I have an 11 month old son. Love Stephen. Stephen is a ball of joy, handsome young man. Um, every time I look at him, I'm like, you're a handsome dude, man. And he's so encouraging. He, he's like always laughing. He laughs even when there's no joke happening. Like sometimes I wake up and he looks at me, he's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. He, just, he just loves laughing and that's encouraging. When I put Stephen in the living room, in his head, he's playing by himself, doing whatever. But I'm watching over him. I have a special concern about what my son is doing. Every move, as he moves too close to danger or something that can harm him, I redirect him. If he goes somewhere else, I redirect him. If he loses a toy, I pick it up behind him and I bring it back to him. I am watching intimately what my son is doing, even when he's not aware that I'm watching him int intimately. And what God is trying to say here when it says, or the psalmist is trying to say here about God, is God is watching intimately over the way of the righteous. There is an encouragement we receive from that when we're like, man, God is watching me. He's making sure that whatever is about to happen will be to his glory. Whatever is about to happen will be to help me be formed. And, and please don't mistake what I'm saying. This isn't that trials don't come or hardships don't come, but God is watching you in the midst of it. He's looking at you in the midst of it. If you live according to God's desires and his standards, he's going to desire you to win. He's going to desire you to, to get some W's. He's going to desire you to have a winning mindset. But it requires you to live according to his standards. You know, the disciples right now who are going through financial hardship, but you're living faithfully, the reason of financial hardship came to you because there were things outside of your control. God is like, I'm watching you intimately. I'm making sure you're going to be okay through this season. It may not be the way we desire. It may not be the way we want it to look, but he's like, I'm watching you intimately. To the disciple who recently got divorced or has been divorced for an extended period of time, you're trying to raise kids to be godly, godly kids, even though you're doing it alone now, God is like, I see you and I'm watching you intimately. I'm watching to make sure that the life you live will honor me. I'm making sure that you're going to have a winning mindset. He's like, I see you and I have a deep concern for you. That's why I'm watching over your ways. To the disciple who's left out of the social group or the success that they desired because they chose righteousness instead of um, the path of the world. God is like, I'm watching you. I have a, 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 a special eye on you. What's happening to you concerns me. To the disciple who's in the midst of dealing with mental health challenges and emotional challenges, but because of righteousness, they're choosing righteousness. God says, I see you. I'm watching you. I'm working with you. The same way I'm trying to help Stephen, God is like, I'm working with you. I'm working through that. Trust me. Hold to my unchanging hand. If you feel far from God right now, maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're, you, you, you feel like, man, Steve, I'm the wicked person. I intentionally live a life not to honor God. God is so good. Let me just say this. If you repent, think of Nineveh. If you repent, he's like, we're good to go. In Ezekiel, God says, I don't desire to see the wicked perish. God's desire is not to see the wicked perish. Now, the wicked chooses for themselves to perish. But God's desire isn't that the wicked would perish. Repent and come to God. So for those of you who feel really far away, it takes one decision to say, man, you know what, God, today I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust the narrative that you've given me. I'm going to trust your son. So how do we have a winning mindset? God first in how we live and how we think in everything that we do. 
It's all about Jesus. It all points to Jesus. The psalm points to Jesus. God, Jesus is God's ultimate word. The word become flesh to dwell among us, you know, tabernacle among us. If you want to have a winning mindset, think what Jesus would do. Live how Jesus will live. Honor Jesus, the king of the kingdom. That's the proclamation of the gospel, that Jesus is the king of the kingdom, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, risen from the dead. How do you have a winning mindset? Jesus, imitate Jesus, think like Jesus, serve like Jesus. Embrace the story of Jesus. Allow him to save you by putting your faith in him. By participating in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism, allow him to save you. And if you have participated in his death, burial, and resurrection, remember that you've participated in his death, burial, and resurrection, and the world has no more say over you. You're under a new lordship. The ways of the world should inform you. The ways of Christ should. How do you have a winning mindset? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbors as yourself. Let that dictate every decision you make financially, socially, in any part of your day. You're going to have a winning mindset. You're going to have a God-first mindset. How do you have a winning mindset? How do you have a God-first mindset that you spend your life chanting, murmuring, wrestling day and night with knowing Jesus? John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, to know Jesus. Eternal life begins with this deep, intimate knowledge of Jesus. Allow that to be what you meditate on day and night, the person and character of Jesus revealed through the Gospels. We want to have a winning mindset, and a big part of a winning mindset is putting God first. Amen. You know, guys, I just want to remind you that we've been fasting as a church, and we want to be able to take passages like Psalm chapter 1, and use that, meditate on that as we fast day and night for this winning mindset to be formed by Christ. You know, it's been great so far. We've been posting videos about mid-afternoon mid, mid, mid fasting. It's been awesome. I just want to encourage us day and night, meditate on God's words as we're fasting to see God do some incredible things in 2021. We want to have a winning mindset in 2021. I love you, church. Have a great day. Welcome back, everyone. Are you ready for today's Bible story? Awesome. Gather around, grab your family, and let's get ready to learn new things about God's Word. We don't want to grow up. So today we have a super fun lesson planned. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be fun to play a game with all of us together? Yeah. So today we're gonna test our memory skills and we're going to quiz ourselves on all things baby Jesus. For today, you're really going to need a notebook or a tablet, so go get that and get ready to test your memory. Now, before we begin anything, we have to go over our Remember Verse. Have you been practicing the Remember Verse? I hope so. On the screen, you're gonna see the first and the last word of the Remember Verse. It's your job to fill in the blanks before time is up. Are you ready? All right, go.
right, how'd you guys do? Let's go over it one last time together. Ready? John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Good job, everyone. I am so glad that you are taking the time to remember these scriptures. It is so important to have scriptures memorized. Even Jesus memorized scriptures. How awesome. So like I said, today will be a little bit different because we're going to be playing a game that will go over some of our past lessons. You can use your notebook, the Bible, your parents. So let's get ready. I'm going to ask you questions and they're going to be up on the screen and you're going to have 15 seconds to answer them. We'll go over the answers together, but try and say or write the words before time is up. Ready? Question number one. An angel was sent to this town to speak to this woman about a baby. What is the name of the town and what is the name of the woman? The town was Galilee and the woman was Mary. Good job, guys. What was the name of that angel? Gabriel, that's right. Gabriel came to Mary. What are some other names given to Jesus? Yeah, we have Son of the Most High, Emmanuel, Savior, Messiah. When the shepherds saw the angels, what was their very first reaction? That's right, they were so scared. In what town was Jesus born? I hope you got this one, it's Bethlehem. Now, why did Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem? They needed to complete a census. Good job, guys. All right, how many wise men visited Jesus? Actually, we don't know. It's not recorded in the Bible. Okay, what are the three gifts the wise men brought? Do you remember? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right, who got that one? How did the wise men get to baby Jesus? That's right, they followed a star. In last week's story, we met a widow who was also a prophet. What was her name and how old was she? That's right, Prophetess Anna, and she was 84 years old. All right, good job. How did you guys do? Thanks for playing along, guys. Really appreciate it. It looks like you've learned a lot. Our next series is going to take us to Jesus' life here on earth how he spent his time and what he did, the people he hung out with. Before we do that, I want to leave you with a scripture. This scripture is a good reference point, and it's really the theme of Jesus' life. You can find it in Matthew 5, verse 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is telling his readers that we are the light of the world. You can be the light of the world. Why? Because Jesus did it first. Jesus is the brightest light, and his example of how he lived gives us an idea of how we should live. So shine your light, guys. Talk about Jesus wherever you go. You never know who is listening. Hey, everyone. This song is called King Jesus is Lord. Here are some moves that you're going to need to know in order to sing along with us. We're going to step on the rock, check if it's solid, then the love of God is going to tumble down. 
And the reason we know is because he touched our souls. And then we're going to dig down deep and we're going to find real gold. Well, I stepped on the rock. The rock was solid. The love of God came tumbling down. The reason I know he touched my soul. I dug down deeper and found me a gold. Uh -huh. King Jesus is Lord. King Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. Walking side by side. Walking side by side. You're never alone. You're never alone. And I know he will answer. 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 Be when I call. Be when I call. Well, I stepped on the rock. The rock was solid, the love of God came tumbling down. The reason I know he touched my soul, I dug down deeper and found me a gold. Uh -huh. King Jesus is Lord, King Jesus is Lord, He's the Lord of all, He's the Lord of all. Walking side by side, walking side by side. You're never alone, you're never alone. And I know he will answer, and I know he will answer, and I know he will answer, and I know he will answer. Me when I call. Rock was solid, love of God came tumbling down. The reason I know He touched my soul, I dug down deeper and found me a gold. Uh -huh. King Jesus is Lord, King Jesus is Lord, He's the Lord of all, He's the Lord of all. Walking side by side, walking side by side. You're never alone, You're never alone. And I know He will answer, And I know He will answer, And I know He will answer, And I know He will answer. Me when I call. Me when Rock was solid, the love of God came tumbling down. The reason I know He touched my soul, I dug down deeper and found me a gold. Uh -huh. King Jesus is Lord, King Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. Walking side by side, walking side by side. You're never alone, you're never alone. And I know He will answer, 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 and I know He will. Rock was solid, the love of God came tumbling down. The reason I know He touched my soul, I dug down deeper and found me a gold. Uh -huh. King Jesus is Lord, King Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all. Walking side by side, walking side by side. You're never alone, and I know He will answer, 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 and I know He will answer. right here next week, same time, same place.